Okay, so in this video, we are going to measure active range of motion of trunk flexion, as well as manual muscle testing for trunk flexion. So trunk flexion happens in the sagittal plane. The end feel is firm. Because we are using a tape measure to measure trunk flexion, there is no established normal value. So for patient position, we're gonna have the patient take her shoes off. So I'm gonna have you take those flip flops off. And I'm actually gonna have you stand in this direction here. Good. <clears throat> so the patient's shoes are off, the feet are shoulder width apart, and then I'm going to stand in front of the patient to give my directions and my instructions. So I'm about to measure how far you can bend forward. So I'm going to have to touch a bone in the back of the neck and down here as well. Okay? So what I want you to do when I say bend forward is you're going to slowly like bring your chin to your chest and then bone by bone by bone you're going to roll down reaching toward the floor as far as you can. All right, let me see you do that. Excellent, and so come on back up. The compensation that we would want to be aware of and minimize would be excessive knee flexion. All right, so head into the back here. Okay, so the process for measuring trunk flexion, active range of motion is we're gonna measure the distance between the spinous process of C7 and S2 while she's standing upright. And then we're gonna measure the distance while she's flexed forward and we're going to take the difference. So you can either palpate C7 first or S2 first. I find it a lot easier to palpate S2 first because it is the more difficult of the two. So I'm going to put my hands on your hips. So I'm palpating iliac crests. I'm coming along to the back. This is the L3, L4 junction. So just inferior to that, that first bump is L4. If I keep going down, that next bump that I palpate is L5. The next one down is S1. And I feel a difference. Like I feel there's it's less fleshy because I'm now on sacrum. And then one more down is S2. So I've got my S2. And I'm going to put my finger on S2 and I'm not going to let go so I don't have to go through all of that palpation again. C7 is pretty easy. So I'm going to have you bring your chin to your chest, please. Good. Come on back up. And there's C7. So I'm going to place my tape measure along from C7 to S2 and it's 44 centimeters. We're going to use centimeters instead of inches. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to hold the lead at C7, and I'm going to let the tape measure flow over my finger down here at S2. Okay, so are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so bring your chin to your chest and slowly roll down as far as you can go. Sorry, I just stepped in front of the camera. And so now she's at 59 centimeters. So 59 minus 44, she's got 15 centimeters of trunk flexion. Come on back up. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything that I really want to tell you. <clears throat> Technically, it doesn't matter if the zero of the tape measure is at C7 or if it's at S2. Um, either way, you should be getting the same number. Personally, I think it's easier to hold it at C7 so that gravity just takes the rest. And you know, when she flexes forward, this just rolls through my hand. But either way, would be fine. And all right, so let's move on to MMT. So I'm gonna have you lie on your back on this table. Okay, so when we do manual muscle testing for the trunk, it's a bit different from all the other parts of the body um, in two ways. One is that for grades four and five, we are not providing manual resistance. So we are not pushing with our hands on the patient to provide the challenge. The way that we provide the challenge for grades four and five is by changing the patient position to make it more challenging. The other thing that makes trunk MMT different is that instead of for grade three having the patient move through their full available range, we have like pre-established um, ranges that we expect every single person to get through in order to earn a three or a four or five, regardless of what their available range is. So for trunk flexion, that's going to be clearing the inferior angles of the scapula. Okay, so the patient is supine and 
I just want to make sure that I don't miss anything. Okay. Okay, so we're going to test for a grade three first. So you've got your arms straight. I'm going to have you have her hold her arms directly over her body. You can cough if you need to. <laughs> okay. Um, and what I want you to do, you're not going to do a full sit up. We do not expect to see a full old school sit up. We want to see more of like a crunch, a more modern crunch. So um, you're going to bring your chin to your chest and roll your shoulders up and reach for your toes. Go for it. Come on back down. Good. So I came back here to make sure that her inferior angles cleared. They did, and then I gave her that cue and come on back down. So she didn't feel the need to go all the way up into a full sit-up. What we want to make sure of, the, the compensation that we sometimes see is lifting of the feet off of the table. So if I saw that, I would say, let's do that again. Let's try to keep your feet down. So she was able to clear her inferior angles in that position, a grade three. So she's at least earned a grade three. So now we're gonna test for a grade four. So you're gonna cross your arms over your chest and you're gonna do the same exact motion. So roll up, come back down. You like very easily, just so you know, like they cleared by, okay. yeah. So you can breathe easy. Okay, and then grade five is the most challenging. So she's gonna cup. Now here's what we don't want. We don't want the patient to clasp hands behind head and then yank on his or her head. We don't, want to, we don't want patients to cause injury while we're measuring their strength. So we like to have them cup over the ears. It minimizes the yanking on their head. The other thing is it's gonna be much easier if the patient brings his or her elbows forward. So we wanna give those cues to keep the elbows out to the side. That is what makes it challenging. All right, we're doing the same exact motion. Keep your feet down, good, come on back down. <laughs> so if she clears her inferior angles, that's a five. Now let's say that we we're going back to grade three. Let's say that we were testing for grade three, that first little crunch. And let's say that she was not able to clear her inferior angles. That's a grade two, because a grade two is either partial range against gravity or full range gravity eliminated. So let's go into the next position. I'm gonna, is hook lying. So I'm gonna have you bend up your knees, plant your feet on the table here. Um, if she couldn't, if she couldn't come up at all and I wasn't able to give her the two, I'm still gonna give her another opportunity to earn a two. So I'm gonna cradle the patient up and by cradling her, I'm shortening um, the abdominal muscles. So I'm putting them more in like closer to their mid range in that, in that bell curve of length tension relationship to give them the best opportunity to fire up and show me that they're working. Okay, so I'm gonna have you lift your head. So I cradle up here and I'm gonna say, can you lean forward a little bit? If there's any rib cage depression, it's a two. If there's no rib cage depression, but I feel something you know, contracting underneath my hands, that's a one. And I don't feel or see anything, that's a zero. You can come back down. So I would be putting my hands right in the center, right along uh, rectus abdominis. And the cue that I gave for a grade two was lean forward. Um, the other one you could give is try to cough. If someone is able to cough, we give them a two. Just the ability to cough means that they have activity in their rectus abdominis. Um, we're at the point in time when telling someone to cough when they're close to your face is probably not the best option. Okay, I think that's it.